everybody. Happy Friday night. Thank God it's Friday. Uh, it is the, what, fifth Friday we've been in the middle of this shutdown. Happy Friday. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective Live. And yes, in the background, that is a Keurig machine that I've moved into my office. In case you haven't seen that recently, that little thing right there is a Keurig machine just so I can get my coffee fresh and hot and not have to walk 10 paces into the kitchen. Uh, Welcome. I hope you're uh, enjoying your weekend so far. It is a weekend, right? Celebrate your weekend. We need to have some sense of normalcy. I know the my mother, I talked to my mom today. Everyone talking to their parents, by the way. Please talk to your parents. Please make sure you tell your parents not to go outside. Why is it that all of our parents are like millennials and are like, well, then I went to work and then I went walk. Don't go outside, parents. Don't go outside, mom. Keep my stepdad inside. That's just a separate little side note. But anyway, I was talking to my mom and she was like, I don't know what day it is. You know what will help? Treat your weekend like your weekend. Whatever you do on Friday night, do it on Friday night, except if, of course, it means you go outside. Or Saturday, just treat it like a weekend, sleep in on the weekends, do those kind of things. It'll help some kind of normalcy. Uh, we're going to be here over the weekend, so hopefully you'll stick with us. We have a great guest tonight. It's super fun. I've been looking forward to it all week, actually. Uh, for the moment she said she'd do this, it is Broadway star and Mean Girl. Kate Rockwell is here with us tonight. Uh, but Mean Girls is just a, one of the handful of Broadway shows she's been in. Legally Blonde, Hair, Bring It On, Rock of Ages. Uh, Kate is, of course, was on the like one of the two... Broadway reality shows back in the day. The Grease, You're the One That I Want. I bet we don't have a picture of that because she probably won't allow us to put that up. But anyway, uh, big time Broadway star, super fun lady. She's going to be on with us just a minute and tell us how she's coping with all of this. Don't forget why we are here. We are here to raise some money for the Actors Fund. So please do us a favor. Beep, beep, beep. Tip that tip jar that's on my Facebook page right there. Throw a few bucks in if you can. You can't go to the movies tonight. You can't go to a restaurant tonight. It's Friday night. Throw a little in for the Actors Fund to help all those people that are going to be seriously in need. Uh, we know they're going to be needing a lot of money over the last month, as I mentioned last night. Um, we're going to get the head of the Actors Fund actually on in a week or so to talk about the programs that the Actors Fund has for people in need. In case you're one of those people, you can use the Actors Fund. It's not just for actors. It's for everybody in the biz. Don't forget to... In all seriousness, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay home. We are reaching plateaus here in New York and starting to around the country as well. But we got a long way to go, so let's not push it. Let's just do this the right way, the right way. Okay, that's all I got for a little opening monologue today. And besides, I'm very excited to get to my guest, so why don't we bring her on quickly? No more delays, no more waiting. Here is the lady you've been waiting for. Please welcome to the live stream, Kate Rockwell. Kate. Yeah, live stream. There you are. <laughs> no one has danced on the live stream yet, so I love it. Thank oh, look at this. Anytime we're on a live stream, anytime we're on a live stream, you have to be dancing. Look, we have a comment already. No music playing. <laughs> we have a comment already from one of your fans. Throw it Hi, right Laura. up there. Hi. Thanks for tuning in tonight. I happen to know that fan very well. Welcome. How are you? How are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm bored, but I'm fine. <laughs> what, um, what is like the one thing you've done that you least expected to do like okay. in the last, like we're so bored. What is the shit that you're doing that like, what? <laughs> okay, so I, I've, been, I've been learning how to cross stitch. Because, right, mm -hmm, exactly, yeah. So I, I'm learning how to cross stitch because I need something to do with my hands because I get fidgety. Um, I, I don't know if you if you knew this, but I've been a little bit busy for the last three years, and it's I literally left Mean Girls. My last show of Mean Girls was three days before the shutdown happened. So wow. I had I had I did technically leave the show. But then the world stopped. And so I knew there was going to be an adjustment period of kind of what to do with my time and to relearn how to rest and be calm and be at home and 
um, have hobbies. I haven't had a hobby in many, in many moons. Um, so I was prepared and I had decided that I was going to learn a new skill. And I, I do knit, I like to knit, but I was like, no, nah, I've done that before. I don't want to do that, I want to learn a new one. And so Gray Henson, who is also Mean Girls, convinced me to start cross-stitching and then the shutdown happened. And so I learned how to cross stage. Wait, I have my, hang on, I can show you. Yeah, show, show us some Kate Rucko originals. I mean, it's not, so I'm gonna make a pillow out of it so it's not stitched all the way together yet I don't have stuffing because of course I don't. But I made this one first. That's amazing. This is my first cross stitch. And I'm gonna, I, so it has a little space here that I'm gonna fill it once I get, I don't, what do you use to stuff a pillow? I don't know, things I never thought I would be doing with my time. But I'm gonna make a little feminist pillow. Um, and then I thought, my, she's watching too, I thought I was gonna send it to my mom. So mom, I'm gonna send this to you. Oh. Done. Surprise, you didn't know that till now. <laughs> Do you have any other completed things there already or is that the one? Oh no, that's the one. Cause see the problem is I bought this kit thinking like, oh, this will take me forever because when am I ever sitting still? And I had like projects lined up and like work I was gonna do and then all of that went away. And so I had all the time and so I finished it really fast. And then I had no other fabric. I had no other colors of, like the stuff they send you with the kit is like the exact right amount of everything you need to make that one thing. So then I had to order a whole bunch of other stuff. <laughs> so now I just, I just recently got fat, this like fancy like special kind of fabric that you need for cross stitching. And so um, I just started this one last night and it looks like nothing right now. <laughs> but yeah, it's like it like it it supposed to be. It looks um, like it is, or something. It is the, it'll look like the, where is it? There we go. The faces of the moon. Okay. That's very, right. yeah, very simple. Well, We're starting to sure well. uh, Apparently, your mom is watching. See? Like, <laughs> she, I was like, she's going to love it. Yeah, mom, I'm making you a pillow. Uh, uh, that's listen. You're keeping your hands busy. What we were talking about before, like it, what's so cool about theater people, and I think it's so important for everyone watching and everyone around the world, is to try to keep yourself busy, no matter what it is. Yeah. You yeah. might cross stitch. You might to have a live stream. You might do whatever it is, but it's important to keep yourself busy. Uh, where? So you were three days out. So where did you? Where were you when you knew? As I've, I've been asking people, where were you when the virus hit the fan? Like when you um, were. I was actually, so I was really, really fortunate that I had started working on a new television show for Amazon and I had, it had just barely overlapped with Mean Girls as I knew that my Mean Girls time was ending. Um, that was sort of ramping up in terms of when they needed me on set. And so I was actually on set. My last day of filming was the same day, not my, wasn't supposed to be my last day, but the last day that I was on production was the last day that Broadway shut down. Um, and so I was sitting on set, you know, in between takes, getting updates from everybody, hearing about the shows and everything. And I was like, what is going on? And I happened to be kind of the only Broadway person on set that day. Like there were other, usually when you work on set in a New York TV show, you kind of know other people that are there, either series regulars or guest stars or whatever. And that particular day, I happened to be the only Broadway person around. And so I'm like, no one's around to talk to. And I'm like, the world is ending, Broadway is shutting down. And no one cared. Like everyone's like, what? I was like, oh no, no, you don't understand. This never happens. Broadway doesn't close, but Broadway's closing. And then two days later, they they stopped production on the TV show as well. So uh, it all it all went very quickly. <laughs> it really it's amazing how Broadway was like the domino for how serious this all was to the world. Yeah, I think I think so. I think we were we were not. I won't say we were the canary in the coal mine. There were a lot of canaries before us, um, warning about how serious this was going to be. And, but I think I think the magnitude of Broadway as a whole making a decision to shut down for an indefinite amount of time was. It, I mean, it, we also coincided with basically all of sports shutting down at the same. We all kind of did that at the same time. Um, I, I think that was just the day that sort of all of us realized that there was just no way to continue business as usual, that we absolutely had to start making some really dramatic decisions to protect public safety. And um, I, Broadway was was a really big marker of like how serious this really is going to be, was going to be, is now, now that we're, you know, in the middle of it. So, um, but yeah, that was, that. I think in our in our tiny little bubble of production, I think we were all kind of like, 
wait, what's going on? Like, are we going to be okay? And then when Broadway announced, I was like, oh, we're not, we're not going to be okay. This is, everything's going to stop. Because <laughs> Broadway, I always used to describe Broadway as like the, the way USPS is supposed to be. Like neither rain nor snow nor like wind or hail, whatever that poem that we used to have about how like the USPS is supposed to be, no matter what, it will always deliver the mail. Well, that is what Broadway is. No matter what is going on on the outside, we are doing a show tonight. Right, so Nothing cancels Broadway, but this did, and and needed to, and, and rightfully so. We had to, we had to make that decision, and I'm glad that we made it then. I'm glad we made it early, so that we could not have a negative impact on public health. But it is a really big deal that when that happened, we I think everybody kind of was like, "Ooh, oh god, it's real. It's very, very serious." Will you miss not being in Mean Girls when it goes back up again? Like that first performance, I mean, it's, and you're, you're like, God dang it, three days. All right, like, I, I mean, I, le I left my show, I had been with them from the very beginning, and I left because, to be very frank, like, I was in a lot of pain. I, doing physical <laughs> comedy eight times a week in stilettos is toxic, and... Um, my body had just had enough and it was time for me to let my body rest and recover and, um, heal a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, that was very much the reason that I decided to leave the show. And, uh, I'm getting that now, which is great <laughs> in a way I never would have anticipated. Um, and yeah, like when we all go back in September, I can just go back. Right. It doesn't work. <laughs> Actually, if you had like ended just a couple days after the shutdown, they would have extended your contract by those two days. You would have been forced to come so back. So ridiculous. I would have to come back for two days. Well, the other trick is that, and this is, I think it's okay for me to say this out loud. Um, we actually, in the same time that we were, it was myself and Barrett, Wilbert Weed that left, and Gray Henson also left. The three of us left on the same day. And um, so while they were kind of initiating all of those changes, they also um, put the changes that they made for the tour company into the Broadway company. So the entire Mean Girls company had been in rehearsal, relearning pieces of the show to kind of install these, these creative changes that the team had made to, for the touring company into the Broadway company, as well as putting these three principal actors into the show. And so actually the, the Mean Girls company, I, I'm, I mean, I'm knocking on wood here because obviously everything can change whenever, but the Mean Girls company actually has not had a lot of COVID cases. Um, whereas a lot of the other current Broadway shows actually did see, we, it kind of moved through our company very, or through our community pretty aggressively. Um, fortunately, for the most part, everybody has been has been able to recover from it pretty quickly. But Mean Girls, we did not see it. And I think it's because everyone was in so much rehearsal that we were actually sort of quarantined together ahead of time. Um, because we were, insta we were kind of instigating all these changes together, they were in rehearsal all day, every day. It was like we'd gone back into previews where they were learning a version of the show during the day and then they were doing a different version at night. Um, they started doing the new version of the show two days before the shutdown and that's it. <laughs> oh, they're going to relearn the show. Thank God I didn't have an ending afterwards because <laughs> then I would have also had to re relearn the show to go in for a week or however long it would have been. So. The timing of it is really insane, but uh, it's going to feel very strange when everyone else goes back to work and I don't because it feels like we all went out of work together, mm -hmm. but actually I went out of work two, three days before that. It just doesn't feel like it. So uh, by the way, if you have questions for Kate, go ahead and throw them up there in the comments yeah. and I'll get to them in a couple of minutes. But you mentioned um, an Amazon television series. Uh, do you, what, what's the difference between you as a uh, acting on screen versus in a big old musical comedy? Do you have to like shift into another gear? Is it a conscious like, oh, I'm in third gear when I'm on stage playing Karen, but for state for screen, it's a whole different thing. Or is it just the same? You know, same um, I think it's a little, I don't think it's that different, quite honestly. There's definitely technical things that are different obviously like volume and and size of action you know like i can't this on camera looks crazy like it just did on this camera um but on stage that looks like fine so like there's those kind of things um but i'm still relatively new to camera work so i'm still learning i would i would by no means say i know what i'm doing on set. um and i know that pe people are so kind with me and so and so patient and 
helping me understand the way that the camera sees things and, and the way to sort of posture yourself for the camera and, and create for the camera as opposed to sort of creating on a stage. But um, I think that the, <laughs> The number one thing, which which I I'm going to say is a positive, is that I no one has ever asked me to play 17 on camera. <laughs> All of these, it, it's just not going to happen, and I think that's lovely. I, I don't mean that as a negative at all. I am I am totally accepting of the of the the responsibility of playing an actual 30 year old, um, which I am well into my 30s, so I, I feel great about that, and so I I don't feel the pressure to. Um, behave a certain way or look a certain way the way that I do on stage because I do just naturally play younger in that in that environment and I there's a part of me that goes like well you you have to have to find it in you you have to remember what being 17 was like whereas on camera it's just I, I I'm just being myself which is which is maybe a cop-out but I think that that's I think it's a little more truthful on camera and there's a little less put upon um but again, I, I would call myself very much a novice still. I, I'm still very much learning in that in that regard. And what about just listen? Your 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 performance in Mean Girls is one of the funniest performances I've seen on a Broadway stage. And what I love is that it's nothing like you, of course. <laughs> it's nothing at all like you. I was going to even try a joke just then, like, and of course, it's exactly you're just playing yourself. But you, you're just so not. Um, which is which is so uh, such a testament to your skill. Uh, tell me just about where you your comic instincts come from, your comic chops. Where did you learn to do this stuff? Do you watch stuff? Is it training? What is? It? How I do you do funny, K. Rockwell? How do you do funny? <laughs> I do definitely have inspiration that I drew, especially for Karen. There are, are people on stage and on on camera that I've seen that I drew from um in terms of inspiration there are people in my real life that i drew inspiration from who i will Ooh. not name I absolutely will not name them nope never ever initials initials and the city where they were born what some, initials and the city where they were born could possibly, we'll, could we'll, possibly. no i would never i would never give away my secrets a lady never tells her age or the people she's stealing from to create com comic tracks um but that's a lie I, can, I reveal my age all the time um but i i also think that one of the things i learned really early on and and I can I can credit my um, my, my college professor I, I went to Baldwin Wallace for musical theater and I studied under a woman named Vicki Bussert and she always used to say she's like get out of your own way get out of your own way and especially with comedy one of the things that I have learned and I have found to be very effective is like stop trying to do anything the, I had Tina Fey writing for me right like writing the, the material writing in my voice at one point like working with me creating stuff I don't have to do anything. It's funny already. Stop getting in the way. Let it be what it is. And one of the most helpful things I ever learned about comedy was the less you do, the more people can hear what's going on, right? So like don't that whole concept of like do not don't put too many hats on hats, right? If something is funny, stop moving. Because if you're moving, they're watching you move and they're not listening to your words. And I, again, it's Tina Fey comedy don't do anything it's brilliant as it is you don't have to help so that's mm -hmm. truly how i approached it i just went like i don't have to do very much and karen doesn't have to do very much like at no point was i ever contributing to the plot i was just there helping you know so i got to sort of i don't want to say sit back because that is not at all what i did it you know it takes a lot of focus and it takes a lot of um you have to be listening all the time but it's very specific. The activity is so specific because unless it is absolutely essential, just don't get in your own way. And that's mm -hmm. all you have to do. And I know that sounds so minimal, um, but truly that is what I was doing is just sort of allowing everything to be what it was. And if you're gonna do something, make sure it's on purpose. Make sure everything you do is intentional. Every action, every time I move my hand, it's on purpose. If I touch my hair, it's on purpose. Otherwise, don't get in the way because it's already funny as it is. It's Mean Girls. It's genius comedy. Just don't screw it up. <laughs> that's not such bad advice, but that's truly how I approached it the whole time. So you do a ton of comedy. Is there uh, a dramatic role in the musical theater that you would love to play? Like, what are you dying to play? I'm dying to play Trina in falsettos. Oh, yeah. yeah, and and someday when someone allows me to play 
an adult female. I, I would love, I would love to sink my teeth into that. We actually did, we did the trilogy in college, you know, back when you like do artsy theater and it's like, Ooh. we did, yeah, we did in trousers trousers as well. into March of the Falsettos, into fal like Falsetto Land, those three pieces. Um, we did all three of them and I, I, you know, there's so many of us, we each did, everybody got to do like a facet and I did March of the Falsettos as Trina at the time. And I just remember thinking, this is actual genius. Like this is the best version of musical theater because it's so in, it's so deep and it's so real and it's so, it, it touches on so many things that humans actually deal with in a very, in, in a only somewhat heightened sense. Because the circumstances of the time were so heightened that you live, you just someday they're going to write musicals about this pandemic, and everything is going to sing easily because we're all living at a nine, right? Mm -hmm. In falsettos, they were living at a nine because of the AIDS epidemic, and everybody was literally worrying about life or death, and so everything was this heightened. It's the same thing. Like it, it sings so easily because everyone is already so worked up that singing seems very natural and. I just thought that I think that that is such genius writing. You don't have to create the circumstances where singing your feelings makes sense. It just makes sense because you were already so uh, high octane. Why wouldn't you sing? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that it's one of the best to me. It's one of the best musicals that we've been given because it all sort of lines up so beautifully. And I would love to sink my teeth into I'm breaking down in a real scene. I would love to get to like chop some carrots <laughs> whatever we do in the production that i get to do i want to i want to chop some carrots <laughs> i was in college when that was on broadway and i second acted that sucker like 27 times i just kept going back and back and back and see it was so good so uh, i mean good. i i have worked with people from the original production and every time i meet someone i'm like you have to understand what that show did for me <laughs> you have to know that yeah. my like co my college self which is how old i was when i learned about the show was like I like hooked my claws into that show and I will not let go. And it has motivated so much of, of what I hope to do as a, as a comedian, as an artist, as a, as a Broadway performer. So you, you, what I love about you is you're, you're always so positive and upbeat and have so much energy, which is so great. Uh, follow Kate on social media. If you want to just get a glimpse of that, of that energy nonstop. Like dogs and food. <laughs> I think I saw your dog. Oh, yeah. oh well, and the big one. So Bessie was behind me for a little while, and she has abandoned us because um, my husband is in the kitchen. So that's much more important. But the little, the little one is here. She's oh. she's always a little, just right behind me, just making sure I don't disappear. <laughs> in a little sleeping in a little bowl. So in a time like this, or maybe the answer is dogs and food. How do, how do you stay positive and and staying upbeat? And we just got quarantined for another month. We're all stuck inside until May fifteenth, at least. Now, who knows when work will come back in the in the way that we all want it to? Yeah. But you're still plugging along, and and you still got that chipper smile on your face. How are you dealing with it? And how how would you advise our watchers to deal with it? I I actually do think dogs and food are the answer. <laughs> Food for sure. There's a great, this, the fact that the camera is cropping right here is excellent for me because I can't put on any of my cute clothes anymore um, because that is all I do. You know, I think, I think a couple things. I actually had a, a meeting this morning with a, a young woman who is in college right now for musical theater and she's a friend of a cousin of mine. And so he asked if, if I would connect with her and chat with her. And we were talking a little bit of, and, and it's, I, I noticed how, kind of bleak her outlook was right now, um, which I completely understand because for somebody who doesn't have a foot in this business yet um, and was just beginning their trajectory into professional theater, I can't imagine how terrifying this must look to them because they already had so many questions and now they have so many more. Um, but one of the things that I said to her that I, I hadn't really articulated yet, but I, I think I did for the first time is, you know, those of us that have been around for a while and, and you know, Mean Girls was such an amazing platform for me and it, it offered me an opportunity to get to know a lot of people and have a lot of people get to know me. But I've been here for 15 years um, and this is my fifth Broadway show and I've done a lot, I've done tours. I left the business for a while. I came back to the business. Um, I, I've done a lot of things and, and, 
had a lot of experiences. And the thing that I know more than anything, the thing that makes me feel okay about all of this is that nothing kills live performance. Nothing kills the passion of, of artists and nothing can, and we know, we all know this, everyone is experiencing this right now. Nothing can take the place of being in the room with someone else, another human being, and sharing an experience with another human being in the room at the same time. If that's sitting at a bar and having a cocktail with a friend, or if that is um, having people in your home, I miss it so much, I miss having people in my home, <laughs> having people in your house and getting to to sit and, and share stories or talk or connect or, there is nothing that trumps that, right? No amount of technology. She's going to do like it. She's inspired to get the blanket off the back of the couch and, and sleep in it. Um, but there's, there is just no substitute for that. And no amount of Zoom conference or Instagram live or um, FaceTime video is going to trump the experience of actually being in the room with somebody. And I think that in general is why live theater has persisted even with all the technology that we have developed over the last 30, 40 years that have created the most incredible film and television and, and any other <laughs> multimedia presentation that we've come up with. Live theater continues to persist because you cannot take away the magic of being in a place with another person. Mm -hmm. And that gives me so much confidence that we're gonna be fine. It's gonna be different. It's gonna take time and it should take time. We we want people to be safe and we want people to feel comfortable because otherwise, what are we doing? We, we don't want to be endangering anybody so that they can like, you know, listen to <laughs> me sing 16 bars. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, it's our job as actors and as storytellers, I, I believe one of my jobs as, as an actor, as a storyteller is to transport people from what is actually happening to what might happen or what could happen or what will never happen. But in these two hours that we're together is happening now. Um, I don't think that's going to be diminished at the end of this. I think if anything, it's going to be um, explosively important. I think people are going to need that. And we have a history of, you know, American civilization at least or Western civilization that shows that when things get scary in real life, live theater is something people turn to and, and rely on as and as an escape and as a way to experience emotion in a safe place that's all going to come back everyone is going to need that outlet and they're going to want to be in a room together again and i want to be i want to be in that room again mm -hmm. <laughs> on stage backstage off stage doesn't matter i you know i know that we're going to need that and so i said to this girl i was like we are not going anywhere Yes, it's going to be different. And yes, it's going to change a lot of things. And I think there are some things that are going to benefit from this. I hope. Oh, I'm on the producer's perspective. I hope it's okay to say this. Don't be mad at me. But I would love I would love to see theater become more affordable again. I would love for this to change the price point where we aren't asking for $500 for a, for a third row seat because it is so challenging for people to be able to access that. I would love for this to be something that motivates us to find ways for theater to be accessible again financially or in whatever capacity we can do. I know I'm talking to a producer who already works in that regard and, and is working very hard to always allow theater to be accessible, but this could be a great instigator for that kind of change, for the financial change that we need to, we need to have. I, I just think that there's gonna be so much wonderful art that comes out of this tragedy you know, art always comes from tragedy and and change and and things that are scary. We we have so many wonderful writers who are sitting at home right now with nothing to do but write. I can't wait to see what they come up with. And and then there is going to be such a such a need for each other and, and a need for creation and a need for escape and a need for entertainment. And I think I honestly, I honestly believe that that is so reassuring to me that like we're all going to come back together again somehow. We're going to make it work. We have over and over and over again, and we will again this time. So I don't panic about it because I go, we'll figure it out together. And there's going to be so much joy in that. We're going to love being together again. <laughs> we're going to be so excited to be in a room creating literally anything. Tiger King the Musical, sure. I'll come to Tiger King the Musical. I can't wait. Exactly. That was like just like like your character and me, girl. You're so much like Karen. Um, we do have a, a question. Oh, it's from that super fan of yours. Uh, speaking of Mean Girls, 
What Lorelai Soper asks, what was your favorite number to perform in the show? I love your part and stop. So favorite moment of Mean Girls to do as a performer? I it's it's a pretty obvious answer. I'm sorry to say. I wish it was more creative, but I loved I loved doing sexy, but I particularly loved the very beginning of sexy, which was um, it's just me on stage by myself. There's not a lot going on um, because it was the moment in the show that I got to break the fourth wall and I got to sort of speak to the audience every night. And what was really cool about that is is I am I try very hard in my in my comedy when I build a show. I really, really want to be consistent. Um, I think consistency is important in live theater to be trusted by your fellow performers, but also the audience deserves to see this, the same quality and caliber show every single night. So I show up every day thinking, this is what I committed to doing and this is how I will do it. And I maintain honesty and I maintain you know, freshness, but I, but I want it to be the same. But that one moment every night was a little different every day because it depended entirely on the audience reaction. Timing was different and the way the jokes landed was a little different. And so every day I felt like the audience and I got to kind of like have a moment where we got to be spontaneous for these 30 bars or whatever it was. Um, so that was my favorite part because every night it was, it was like, I have no idea what they're going to do. Maybe they will think I'm terrible tonight. And then I guess I'll just keep going. <laughs> And then the song proper kicks in and like 30 amazing dancers come on and everyone watches them. And I sort of just ride that energy for the rest of the number. All right. Another one here. Kira asks, funniest onstage mishap. Hi, Kira. Um, funniest funniest mishap. Mishap. I would say uh, there was, there were several. I think my favorite was when you're about to, when you guys interview her, you should definitely ask her about this. Um, Ashley Park threw the burn book in the pit. Yep, during the scene where we talk about the burn book and we read out of the burn book, Ashley accidentally hit it and it went off the stage and into the pit. And we were just stuck on stage with no burn book talking about the burn book. Like we were supposed to be reading the pages from it and there was no burn book because it's in the pit. Um, and what happened to be, I mean, the, the most amazing part of all is that at the time our conductor was Alex Gemignani Tony nominated performer Alex Gemignani, who also conducts orchestras because he's Ridiculous. a genius. Um, and so he was in the pit, and when it went flying off, everyone sort of froze as we all processed what had happened. The audience can see it. They start laughing because we, we are laughing because we have no burn book. And Alex just like so gently, just slowly like <laughs> leans down, no one's gonna grabs the burn book, and like, oh. It's like hands it up to us and I so again just as slowly I like reach out we're like operating in slow motion I reach out I take it I go thank you <laughs> and I put it on the stage and Ashley Park it's like she did it so that she could have the last laugh goes wow Regina your butler is really nice <laughs> and the audience goes ape shit you know starts laughing cackling and we're shaking, I'm like on stage, like shaking, laughing as I'm like holding the burn book down with all of my strength to make sure it stays on the stage for the rest of the scene. It was just, it, and it was, it was so brilliant and, and so much fun. And none of us were good actors. We all just laughed our way through the rest of that scene. And I can't, I was like so excited to run off stage and be done. Because I, I was like, I can't believe all that just happened. We will never forget that as long as we live. What's amazing is there are probably, you know, 1,500 people that remember that and just talk about that like crazy as one of their most beloved Broadway memories. That is one of your like big Broadway efforts. Even though it wasn't being you. Oh, I mean, and it, we just, we were so unprofessional. I wish I could have kept it together. But how do you keep it together when you throw the most important prop in the entire show off the stage in front of the audience? It was, it was a great moment. Uh, here's another one. Do you, uh, Norberto asks, do you have a special routine before going on stage? You do. Are you a routine person? Same thing every day. What do you do? I'm not too much, but I did have um, a little bit of a routine. I would come down. So we weren't in the opening, right? So there were two numbers before we went on stage, and the three, the three plastics. And so we would come down during. Um, where do you belong is the big number that was sort of going on on stage and backstage at the August Wilson is very, very packed. So really you do not go on the deck until you need to, because you will be in the way. There's just, there's so many set pieces and so many people and costume changes. So we sort of would stay up in our dressing room until right before, but I would come down a little bit early by myself 
because I like to, to, to put it in somebody else's words, I would, I like to stare at the wall. Um, it was very hard for me to drop into Karen from my real life because uh -huh. my brain, as I'm sure everyone's watching, I kind of go a mile a minute and I'm very, my brain is always on and I'm sort of always working and I've got 30 things happening at one time. Um, but Karen doesn't. And so I found it very challenging to sort of be like up here doing my thing and then run on stage and start doing Karen. I would be too busy. So I would go downstairs and I would go in the dark backstage where we were about to do kind of get on the table to go on stage. And I would stretch a little bit and my job was to just stop thinking. And I would just stare at the wall or the floor or the table or whatever. And like kind of set, it was kind of meditative, honestly. If I mean, other smarter people would call it meditation. But <laughs> I just said, I was like, I just have to go stare at a wall for a little bit and like stop thinking because if I think too hard, then Karen is too busy and it's not funny anymore. You know, her stillness was such a big part of the comedy. Um, and so that, that was my, <laughs> my routine is I'd go downstairs, I'd like touch my toes and then I would kind of just, like turn off for a few seconds. I don't know about you. <laughs> that was uh, my routine. Anthony Veneziali, the, the creator of Freestyle Love Supreme, talked about his routine before he goes on, and it's like freestyle rapid, of course, like to whatever song. It's the exact opposite of yours. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, so his brain needs to be operating in all cylinders to be able to do the craziness that is. Yeah. So I don't. I, I don't know. I have so much respect for them and in the most like jaw dropping, I don't understand kind of way. Um, but my job was to stop thinking. Do not think. No more thinking for two and a half hours. And by the end, end of the show, I was like so calm. I was like, this is the best meditation anybody's ever given me. Is like, I should spend two hours not thinking? Sure. Just being as present as possible is great. It was a great exercise. Right. I've got news for you. Plenty of jaws drop at your performances in all of your shows. So Thank you for making us laugh on stage. Thank you for making us smile here. And you've definitely helped all the people watching, including me, get through another one of these crazy days. So Thanks, thank you for being here. Best to your dogs and dispenser. My pleasure. Thank you. I will tell them to say hi and say hi to Tracy and McKenna for me. I will. Take care. Bye. Well. Kay Rockwell, everybody. You can see why we wanted her. She is just like a dose of the good stuff to get you through the day. Uh, Thanks to her. Thanks to all of you for watching another episode of The Producer's Perspective live. Don't forget about the Actors Fund. If you enjoyed Kate and if you're enjoying these live streams, do us a little favor and just throw some coin in the till there for all those people that could use it right now. Who do we have tomorrow and who do we have coming up? Mary Dina, my producer on the show, uh, she has been working her tail off. She had no internet today. No internet. And she was booking people like crazy. Show us, show us who we've got coming up, Mary. Show us who we've got coming up. Look at all these people. Rob McClure. Je look at all the Ali Stroker is going to be like all these incredible people. Like Joe Iconis is going to be here. We have Mary Lou Henner tomorrow. Ashley Park. I mean, this is going to be a fantastic couple of weeks, everybody. And what else do you got to do? Might as well visit here. Oh, let's just bring on a special guest. Mary, do we have that other person backstage with us still? Can we bring her on? God. Mary lost her internet. Oh, look, everyone. It's Summer. Hello. One of our <laughs> staff members. Mary lost her internet, so Summer was lurking backstage just in case something happened. So say hi to everybody, Summer. Hello, everyone. Uh, Summer runs our Theater Maker Studio platform uh, from Orlando, Florida, where she's sheltering place down there. Thanks for being our backup. You got it. I'm in big trouble. She's going to be very mad at me for doing that tomorrow. Okay, say bye, Summer. Bye. Uh, that was Summer, everybody. Uh, she very much lives up to her name. She's uh, one of my fantastic staffers. I have a great staff. Uh, Actress Fun we did. Tomorrow we did. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay home. Don't forget. And lastly, something to make you smile as if Kate Rockwell and as if Summer wasn't enough. We are going to make you smile just a little bit more with, oh, get this. This is the cast of the 2006 revival of A Chorus Line doing A Chorus Line in Quarantine, doing the opening number from A Chorus Line just for you. You know, A Chorus Line could literally be one of the best musicals ever, ever written, ever written. 
Uh, Ed Kleban wrote the lyrics, a class act. Lonnie Price is like six degrees of separation here. Chorus Line is a great one. If you're a, if you're a musical theater lover, now's a great time to study a chorus line. Why was it so good? Watch it. Watch the number. Read it. Listen to it. Use it to help fuel your own work, but use it also to make you smile. Go to the producersperspective.com backslash smile. Watch all the videos. Have a great night. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you tomorrow. Mary Lou Henner. She's going to be great. See you tomorrow, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.